you specifically focus in law for e-commerce and social media. Is that right? Yeah. My, my practice focuses on advertising and e-commerce compliance. Okay. Very cool. What got you into that niche? I saw in your profile, you worked at a, like a really big law firm to start. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I, I worked at a big firm for about six and a half years and I was uh, doing class action defense litigation. So in California, especially a lot of class actions involve claims about false advertising. And so uh, that subject matter advertising law and the issues that come up was the most inherently interesting to me of the practice areas I was exposed to. So I, I focused more on that as time went on. And when I decided that staying at a large firm was no longer what I wanted to do and starting my own practice is what I wanted to do. I figured, uh, I, I tried to think about what practice would be most satisfying for me professionally. And, um, I didn't, I, I enjoyed litigating less and less as time went on for a variety of reasons, but, um, but my focus now is helping clients avoid those advertising issues that, that can lead to litigation in the first instance and uh, be proactive to help clients develop campaigns in a way that still converts and, and matches their risk tolerance. That's awesome. And I know, you know, we connected through Twitter because of a post that you put out that, uh, you know, I believe went viral, I had quite a bit of traction. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was about the FTC update with influencer content and UGC. Um, just from a super high level, like, do you see that as being a big red flag for e-commerce companies down the road um, and something that will affect, you know, most e-commerce companies as they move forward with marketing? Yeah, the the update is, and the fact that it went viral is is kind of interesting. The rules that the FTC has in place around deceptive advertising and false advertising generally that are addressed in some greater detail in these updates have been around for a long time. So all e-commerce companies have been subject to the basics of those rules for, for a very long time. And so it's not like the updates to the endorsement guides are some kind of radical change that's going to, you know, upend the industry and everybody has to start from scratch or anything like that. I, I think part of the reason that it it caught on and garnered so much attention and and based on some of the reactions i could tell that it it it, it appeared to take a lot of people by surprise and i think that that sort of underscores the issue that there's just a a lot of lack of awareness about these rules that have existed for a while and you know that's understandable when you when you start a business it's not like running to check out what the rules are for every legal issue possible is one of the first things you're going to do. It's, you know, you want to get into the business of being profitable and, you know, serving whoever your constituents are and, and things like that. So I think it just reflects sort of a broader lack of awareness about the rules that might apply to what your business is doing. And the, these updates just sort of either uh, brought that to people's attention for the first time, or was a reminder of all of the different aspects of what regulators like the FTC are paying attention to. Yeah. And, and does that, do you feel like a lack of, um, what's the term I'm looking for? Policing on it plays into that as well, because I feel like, you know, with UGC in specific platforms where you just put up a job posting, you find some creators, you ship them your product. They say what you want them to say. You pay them a hundred dollars and that's that. Like, um, that seems to be pretty common in the e-commerce industry. Yeah, it's incredibly common. And, and so is non-compliance. And so it's understandable the feedback that I get a lot of the time where a client or a potential client or someone on Twitter will say, well, look at all these brands who are not doing what you claim the law says you have to do. And it's kind of a tricky issue because it's not like the FTC is asleep at the wheel, but they obviously can't be everywhere at once. Like they just don't have the resources to go after everyone. They're potentially getting a pretty significant budget cut here in the new in the near future. So part of it is just they they can't effectively police the entire marketplace. But state at the state level, attorneys general do 
a significant, uh, d- like t- taken together across the states, they play a very active role in um, bringing similar types of enforcement actions. And similar to like lack of awareness about what the rules are, it, it's not it's not the case that you would be aware of all of the enforcement and policing that does go on. You know, we, we can pay attention to what the press releases say and what the regulators are doing and the sorts of consumer class action lawsuits around the same issues that are filed. But we, we can never really know how many investigations have started that are still expensive to respond to, even if they don't result in a full blown enforcement action or how many cases have been resolved before a lawsuit was filed, or how many cases there are in state court that are harder to pick up on the trackers that we have. And so we really only have a a small piece of what we're privy to in terms of how much activity is actually going on. So the, the fact that you don't know anyone or have heard anyone in your industry who's gotten in trouble, it's possible that you do and they have not shared that information with you. And it's also possible, well, I mean, it's the case that there are competitors probably as we speak that are involved in some kind of legal issue about the subject matter that we're going to talk about. Yeah, I guess. And, you know, build in public is a popular thing, but I guess people don't shout at the rooftops if they get audited by the IRS. And this would be something similar as well. Yeah. And, and if you do have counsel helping you, they would tell you, please, please do not discuss this on social media. Yeah. There's almost ever, there's almost never any upside to doing that. Yeah. And uh, through your post, actually, I went on to the FTC website and was looking through the updates. I didn't read the entire bill, but I did go through their commonly asked questions that I believe they answered, like that's their mm-hmm. actual answers to it. And let's just dive into it a little bit. You know, from my perspective, the way I was seeing it, it mainly looks like now brands and influencers need to go past just having the paid promotion mark that is native to the platform. And they can't just necessarily put it in the actual description of, let's say, the TikTok video or the uh, Instagram reel. It actually, they need to verbally say it in videos or there needs to be some sort of watermark or stamp over the video showing that there is paid promotion for, am I correct with that? You're spot on with that. And that was one of the changes in these updates where the FTC uh, is now much more particular about what it means to clearly and conspicuously disclose a material connection. So these, these new examples where they do get that particular reflect what the FTC has appeared to uh, espouse recently from what you can glean from enforcement actions and settlements. They just didn't, uh, you know, put it down in written form in that guide document yet. But yeah, they 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 have emphasized that clear and conspicuous to them means unavoidable. There they sh- there should not be a situation where a reasonable person looking at that piece of content does not understand that they're being advertised to. So, like you said, in the context of video content where there's an audio and a visual component. The FTC wants to have that disclosure made in both audio and visual formats in case someone's, you know, playing a YouTube video in the background or in their car or something, and they wouldn't catch that visual one. You need to have the audio to make sure that it is unavoidable. Okay, that's good to know. And um, there's a couple of, you know, kind of alternative paths you can do. I mean, so generally, when you think UGC, you think a platform like... um, the name of it escapes me, but one of the platforms where you go on and you pay a hundred dollars for content, right? But you know, there's strategy some e-commerce companies do where they just send free product with no direct ask and hope through, you know, reciprocity that that person posts content. In that specific strategy, would the FTC still be expecting for some sort of, you know, promotion label or call out? Yeah, generally the answer is going to be yes. There's there's okay. a little bit there's there's a, a small area that is not made any more clear by these updates in terms of a situation where you're giving out free product. Mm-hmm. So I think really quickly it might be helpful to at a high level explain when these disclosure requirements are triggered. So the FTC says that anytime there's a material connection between an advertiser like a brand and an endorser like an influencer or a creator that 
and that material connection is not otherwise obvious to the audience, then it needs to be disclosed. And a, a material connection is a relationship between that advertiser and the endorser that would affect the weight or the credibility that a consumer would give to that endorsement. So the classic example or the most basic example is if I pay someone to say good things about my product, a customer would probably want to know that there's that relationship because they might give that endorsement less credibility if they knew that it was paid for. And so in that situation, the relationship needs to be disclosed clearly and conspicuously, unavoidably through something like hashtag ad or one of the other ways that the FTC says is okay. And so the within the category of material connections, it's not just payment can also be offering someone uh, discounts or other incentives like a sweepstakes entry or an invitation to an event or a free stay at a hotel. Um, in, in the case I'm going to come back to, um, get, receiving free product in some situations. Um, but it's not limited just to this sort of payment relationships either. There, it can be an employment relationship. If on your personal Twitter, you're talking about the company that you work for and how great their products are, the FTC would say the audience should know that you have that relationship. You work for that company. Um, family relationships is another one. If you're talking about your spouse's business and there's several others that could, depending on the situation, constitute that material connection that needs to be disclosed. So in the context of, um, free product in exchange for reviews. What, what is very clear is that if you send someone free product in exchange for a review, you have some agreement, like the reason you're getting this is so that you make a post and you're obligated to do that. In almost every case, that's going to be a material connection that needs a disclosure. Similarly, if you send uh, free product and you express the expectation or the desire for the recipient to create content. Like, hey, hope you love this sweater. Uh, we'd love for you to make a post about it. If you do, here's what, what you should include in that post. What's not entirely clear is if you send a free product with absolutely no communicated expectation that anything comes of it. The new guides give a series of examples that of situations where there's free product, where there may be an obligation to disclose and where there may not be. And so the factors that they're looking at include who the recipient is in terms of how they built their audience. So for example, if I have a YouTube channel and it's dedicated to sneaker reviews and that's all that I do, and that's why my audience goes there and a shoe company sends me an expensive pair of sneakers for free and I review it, I probably do, the FTC would say, need to disclose that I got them for free because my audience will care about that because that's why they go to my channel to get that kind of content. The other consideration is the, the value of the product itself. So they give this example in the new guides about a, a woodworking influencer and they say, um, you know, this person has their channel built around reviewing woodworking equipment and they receive a very expensive lathe for free. FTC says that that would, the audience would care about that and would want to know that you got it for free. On the other end of the spectrum, they have an example about a, a software developer or a software publisher that gives a creator a, an app that would otherwise cost 99 cents and they give it to them for free. The take is, well, it's possible that the audience does not care that they saved 99 cents when they got this product. It's not really going to affect um, how that person reviews it or, or the audience's impression of it. So the, the other area that is where I think they could have been more clear in the context of this free product issue, they give an example of um, a creator who reviews hunting and camping equipment. And they say that the, uh, a knife company sent them a knife for free, uh, hoping that they would post about it. And the question is, you know, I, I'm not obligated to post. I don't have any other relationship with this brand. 
I, as the creator, don't personally think that my review will be biased because of it, the, the, because I received it for free, do I still need to disclose? And the FTC says the safe thing to do in that situation is still to disclose that you got it for free. The issue I have with that is they, you know, what does it mean that the brand hopes you make a post? Was that hope conveyed to the creator? Like, mm -hmm. hey, you don't have to create any content, but we hope you do. Or is that something that they they just privately hope that something comes of it? And if it's the mm -hmm. latter, then, you know, that that's the case. Anytime you give anyone something for free as a brand, like, of course, you hope that somebody goes on and, and makes content about it. So I wish they had been more specific about that because I could, I could see uh, an argument that like if the brand privately hopes that something great happens from this, but I literally just receive a package in the mail and, and that's it. Is that really a material connection that, that I need to tell everyone about? And I, I think that is, uh, the FTC did not answer that question as directly as I think most people would have liked. Yeah, they did leave some blurred lines or some gray areas that could lead to a lot of interpretation, which could cause some obstacles in court. I, and I feel like I remember, and I could have just dreamed this up, honestly, but I feel like I remember there was one part of it that was talking about with asking for reviews from customers, like their email uh, after purchase. There's a section about how you can't segment that to only focus on the reviews that you believe will be positive. You have to go for the positive and the negative. And I think it also said you can't filter out negative ones. Am I wrong or right there? You're you're exactly spot on. And and that issue around um, review manipulation has been a priority for the FTC for at least the last year. And we're seeing that reflected in uh, some of the recent enforcement actions here in these endorsement guides and in an entirely new rule that they've proposed specifically addressing um, fake reviews and other uh, review manipulation yeah. tactics. So, yeah, they, they don't want reviews to be presented in a way that doesn't accurately reflect what your customer base actually believes about the product. So. If you're filtering out reviews under three stars, there's a big fashion retailer that got in trouble for that within the last year. Um, and like you said, you, you should not only solicit reviews from customers that you think will give positive feedback. Um, there, there's another law that's enforced by the FTC that prohibits in consumer contracts, including language like, hey, you agree not to leave us a bad review anywhere. You can't do that. So mm -hmm. that, that issue of allowing people or, or trying to set a policy where customer reviews actually reflect the real experiences and the real opinions of the entire customer base is something that's very important to regulators right now. Yeah, I've heard of people complain about agencies doing that. I think they called it like a disparagement clause or something to where the agencies had in their contract that you can't put anything negative about your experience, even if you have one? Um, yeah, it's, okay. it's different for business to business relationships. Uh, it's the Consumer Review Fairness Act is the law that says in, in customer contracts, you can't put a clause in there like you agree not to leave us a bad review on Yelp or something like that. Mm -hmm. And several states have similar versions of that. Um, but yeah, it's different if it's like an agency contracting with a business or business to business, you can have non-disparagement clauses depending on what they say in those kinds of contracts. But the the policy uh, focus is on not silencing customers from leaving honest reviews about the product. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I mean, that's a, I've seen YouTube videos on it. That's a really big problem with Amazon and just Amazon. There's whole companies that just, you know, do product reviews and help boost your product reviews. And it's mm -hmm. completely fake. Like they, in the video called the company that was doing it and said, you send us what you want us to put in the reviews. We'll do 130 days. This is the price, which is just crazy. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like it's happened so much that, you know, sometimes it's just expected. Like it's, you know, people just expect that to happen. Yeah. I mean, personally, I certainly do. I, I don't, I don't personally don't believe any reviews, except if I'm in, really interested in a product, I'll, I'll try to go on Reddit and find the subreddit dedicated yep. to that product <laughs> and then type the product name in. 
And even then I can tell that, or I can suspect that a competitor is trashing them or, or yeah. something like that. But Amazon reviews, I mean, based on what we've been talking about and on other platforms and the data that the FTC collected uh, in advance of proposing this new rule about fake reviews, it it's just such a widespread and rampant problem. And it's one that seems impossible to completely get rid of. I mean, Amazon, to their credit, it, they take action all the time about trying to ban, uh, remove fake reviews and ban sellers who they are aware are engaging in that practice. But you, I don't know how you could ever completely put an end to that. Yeah, one thing I saw an agency owner talking about, and she's in New Zealand, Australia, was that she saw Amazon was looking at testing or rolling out a notification for each product to show you the return rate, to actually show mm. you the percentage of people that purchase that return, because that could be a red flag there. If you see that 80, 90, you know, 70% of people are returning an item. Yeah, as long as that information couldn't also be exactly. manipulated. Yeah. You know, as soon as yeah. you introduce that, someone out there is thinking yeah. of a way to game it. But that would certainly help if it if it was accurate. Yeah. Well, so are there any other, you know, big updates or any other things that are just, you know, red flags that you see common uh, happening in e-commerce or you try to keep clients from, you know, walking into this year or, um, you know, in the past year or so? Um, in, in the context of just these endorsement guide updates, I think you, you covered the big ones. The, some of the other changes are more minor, like they've expanded the endor the definition of who an endorser can be to cover AI influencers or virtual mm -hmm. influencers, which mm -hmm. is kind of interesting. I haven't really seen that come up as an issue that I need to talk to clients about yet. Um, and they also expanded the definition of what an endorsement can be. So even just clicking like on a post could constitute an endorsement um, and, and some other more minor updates that aren't as important as the ones we've discussed. But more broadly, in terms of issues that come up in e-commerce compliance, I mean, there's so many that uh, common things uh, involve use of UGC, not just from like a regulatory perspective, but like rights clearance, um, the engagements that you have with the creators. I see disputes between creators and brands and agencies all the time. Um, it, it, stepping away from sort of the content of advertising, um, there's issues with uh, how you display promotional pricing, like if you're running a sale with strike through pricing, there's federal and state laws that can get very particular about appropriate ways to do that and what's not appropriate. Um, subscriptions and auto renewal services is another big area where there's a there's a federal law and then there's a patchwork of state laws that get very, very particular about what you have to tell consumers before they purchase, after they purchase. Um, and does that fall back on the app more often than not? Or do you feel that the e-commerce companies have to still be cautious of it and worry about if their app is compliant? Uh, it depends if they have their own app and which pl which marketplace they're going through, how much mm -hmm. they can rely on, you know, the Apple stores uh, presentation of those terms. I'm, I'm thinking more in terms of like, DDC websites where you're checking out from the site. Sorry, I meant like a subscription app, like Recharge or something like that. Oh, like do those, like are those plugin. apps in charge of the compliance with the state and federal or do the e-commerce companies still need to be on top of that as well? From a regulatory perspective, ultimately the compliance is shared by everybody involved. So mm -hmm. it, it, you can have, I, I haven't looked at like Recharge's terms and whether they'll indemnify you in case there's some issue. But ultimately, the compliance is everyone's responsibility who's involved in whatever the activity is. And so I would, I would hesitate to rely on some app to ensure that or just assume that everything they're doing is compliant and that they would honor some indemnification obligation if it came to it. It really is worth having someone take a look at how that process is set up, including 
before they check out at checkout, the confirmation emails, the renewal emails, the cancellation mechanism. And this sounds really nitpicky. And, and I understand the pushback sometimes of brands who will say, look, no one's really doing this the way you're saying it. I haven't heard of anybody getting sued for not putting the font in bold, but I have because, <laughs> because I, I have alerts set up for this thing that show me every day who's getting sued for what in certain areas like this. And it, it's not just the regulators that you have to pay attention to. The, the way a lot of plaintiff side consumer class action attorneys work is they'll look at these laws that come out and a few states have recently adopted new laws about subscriptions and they'll comb through all the nitpicky requirements like North Carolina's specifically says that a certain part of the subscription information has to be in size 12 font and it has to be bold. So if I'm a, if this hypothetical plaintiff's lawyer, I'm going to pick up on that, find that interesting, and then search the internet to see who's not doing that, which is not a very difficult thing to do. And mm -hmm. when I find one or more targets, then maybe I'll run an online, online campaign that says, Hey, have you purchased from Udemy or something? We'd like to hear from you. And then that'll go to a landing page. And so they'll, they'll find a, they'll understand a new law, try to find violations and then try to find a plaintiff. So it's, it's rarely the case that, that these cases are started by some disgruntled consumer who then goes and finds a lawyer. It's these lawyers have very, very strong incentives to find all of these violations and then try to match a consumer to it. And then in that North Carolina example, that was from last month in a, a court ruling on it for the first time said, yeah, the New York times forgot to, or just didn't know they had to put this one sentence in bold. And so this case can go forward as a, as a class action about subscriptions. So at times it can seem like, you know, who really cares about the fine print? Is that really such a risk? Sometimes the answer is, yeah, that's a big risk. Sometimes it's maybe that's not quite as much of a risk, but it's certainly worth understanding that the risk exists so that you, then you can decide how much that matters to you. Yeah, I've heard of that happening similar with um, website accessibility for people Absolutely. with um, like visual impairment or impairments that way. And I've heard of lawyers doing very similar things for yeah. that as well. Yeah, that's the area where that business model I described is most blatant. I mean, it, mm -hmm. hundreds of those are filed every single day. And it's honestly ridiculous, but that's that's the state of what we have right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you sharing all that on the FTC um, updates. You know, I have some rapid fire questions that I ask at the end of every episode and we'll just kind of piggyback off what we just talked about. If you had to summarize everything that we discussed today into one, I say marketing mindset, but we'll say um, legal minded mindset, how would you describe the FTC updates for anyone listening? I would say that they reiterate the fundamentals of the law that has already applied to everyone in the marketing space in the United States. And they serve as a, a good reminder that it's worth making sure that you understand what those rules are and, and how they may or may not apply to your business practices so that then you can look at your risk tolerance and say either I'm comfortable with what we're doing or maybe we should change what we're doing to avoid a risk that we're not comfortable with. And for anyone listening that's in the stage of figuring out what they'd like to do in the marketing industry, what marketing role or roles do you think will have the highest opportunity in the next three to five years? Hmm. That That's a, as a lawyer who, who focuses uh, pretty specifically in one area of it, what roles will have the most opportunity? I generally don't like AI. I'm not a fan of all the, okay. all the hype around it, but I will say it, it does seem like, I, I don't think that it's going to be such a, a revolution in the way that people on Twitter are talking about it. But I think that there's the way we use technology is probably going to change more rapidly than it has in the past. And so those people that can understand how to actually use new technology in a way that's valuable and not just noise, 
that would be uh, an area that an organization could find a lot of value in. So understand separating the signal from the noise in terms of new tech like AI and how to actually deploy it in a way that saves time that I would say that's probably going to be more valuable than ever. Things like automation, things mm -hmm. like, um, you know, busy work, research, data reporting, stuff like that. Right. Somebody yeah. who can understand like how to use new tools to actually become more efficient and not just get distracted by everything they can do would be yeah. a lot of value. And tell us where is it best for listeners to connect with you and learn more about your practice? Yeah, I'm most active these days on Twitter. It's at Robert Freund Law. Um, same username on Instagram. And you can always find me through my website as well, which is robertfreundlaw.com. Perfect. Robert, I appreciate you coming on today. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate the invitation.